couple of seconds. Sure. Hello, everybody. We have our next speaker, Shailesh Gupta. He is a chief of staff at Podcast, our bronze sponsor. Shailesh had previously worked in management consulting as well as strategic sourcing, manufacturing, and last mile logistics across Singapore, Dubai, and USA. Passionate about technology and supply chain, Shailesh will speak on the impact of port congestion on shipping and what can we do about it. Once again, we thank our bronze sponsor for their support. All over to you, Shailesh. Hi, everyone. Uh, this is Shailesh here. First of all, really glad to be here. Thank you, Chris, for the introduction. Today, I'm planning to talk about port congestion. Uh, just uh, for an introduction, so Portcast is a startup based out of Singapore, and we work in the supply chain visibility space, uh, specializing in the space for container shipping visibility. Uh, port congestion is something that has been top of mind for most people in the industry, and hence I'm assuming for most people over here as well. Uh, hence, want, wanted to take this opportunity on this platform to delve a little bit deeper into the topic which has, uh, yes, taken away sleep from a lot of us. So without further ado, let me dive right into it. Okay, so supply chain disruptions uh, have been extensively covered by the media in the last uh, couple of years. Uh, having worked in supply chain management in the past, in manufacturing, strategic procurement, uh, the industry at large, a lot of times thought about supply chain as a cost. It's, it's, it has not been considered as something that really affects revenue. And uh, within larger corporations, sometimes this element is discounted. Like the argument that is given is, how, how much can you even reduce cost? And after a point of time, it just needs to work. Uh, that changed quite a bit during the last two years. And with all the disruptions in supply chain that has ha happened, uh, that's the reason that the industry got a lot of media coverage. And I think at some point people started to realize that supply chain is really just a cost, but it's a competitive advantage. If your competitor is not being able to get the products on the shelf, but you are, because let's say you have a more resilient, uh, a more predictable supply chain, then uh, you've directly influenced revenue. And uh, I think that realization of having supply chain as a competitive advantage is good for the industry, even though the disruptions themselves might not have been. Uh, the disruptions in uh, quite a significant portion of this has also happened because of port congestion. Another reason why uh, this has been picked as, as the topic for this uh, presentation. So what exactly are we going to be talking about today? Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the magnitude of port congestion across different ports, not too much. Uh, I think everybody knows that the problem is significant. We will dwell a little bit into what are the different driving factors that have led to port congestion. We will try and nuance a little bit more on what exactly is the impact of uh, congestion on the end consumers uh, on B2C businesses, or let's say B2C units of the businesses and on the, the core B2B functions as well. Within businesses, the lens that uh, we've tried to look at today specifically is uh, manufacturers and uh, freight forwarders, uh, given both, both of these are ones that uh, are the most directly impacted by SCM and uh, by, by congestion and hence the wider ecosystem is also impacted by the same. And lastly, uh, we'll go to some of the things that can be done to mitigate the issues that congestion have been, has been causing. And as an industry, how can we prepare for such cases where they are, let's say, unavoidable. And I think I've been listening to previous conversations as well uh, people are saying that it will happen and no single player can control the macro market and say that we will remove uh, congestion, but uh, there is a lot, lot that we can do in order to mitigate it and mitigate the impact of this happening. 
So uh, getting right into it, uh, first we are looking at port congestion uh, across the ports for China. So I think like China being the manufacturing hub of the world, it's all eyes on China when it comes to anything related to ports or shipping uh, or like supply chain supply chains broadly. So as you can see that uh, there has been a very significant increase between uh, March, uh, between April of 2021 and May of 2021. And uh, ever since then, it has been going up and down uh, due to various reasons, but uh, it started due to COVID uh, as well as the effect of the Swiss Canal uh, having been blocked. So when such an incident like the Swiss Canal happens, the, the effect of that is not localized in time to the duration in which the event has happened. Uh, the effects of such an incident can reverber reverberate in the industry for a pretty significant time. And that is what we've seen uh, across the globe. Uh, specifically for China, you can see that the congestion has gone up by like more than 2x after that incident took place. On this particular graph, we are looking at Asia more broadly, not just China. So there is the blue line, uh, which represents the uh, number of hours that let's say a typical ship is waiting off the is spending wa to waiting outside the ports in china that's the blue line you can see the spike that happened due to localized lockdowns that uh, happened in shanghai uh, as china pursued the the zero covid policy uh, and uh, and it still comes up sporadically the yellow line is uh, the Indian subcontinent uh, and uh, the red line is uh, the Southeast Asia, so Singapore and uh, the nearby ports. Moving forward, uh, this is another sneak peek into the congestion that is being observed in ports uh, across Europe and the Middle East. So the blue line is uh, for ports in uh, in Europe and, uh, sorry, the red line is uh, the ports in Europe and uh, the blue line is ports in uh, Mediterranean. Apologize for my typo. But uh, as the demand in the US increased, the transatlantic trade also increased, which did affect the amount of congestion that was being observed for these ports in Mediterranean. The, there is a spike towards the end uh, which is mainly due to the Russia-Ukraine conflict, the Russian invasion of Ukraine, uh, which has led to increased pressure uh, in terms of congestion for both European and uh, ports across the Mediterranean Sea. Moving on. So I think the last few slides tried to capture that there is an impact, that uh, it has gone up, it has been fluctuating, there is a problem, something that we all really know. Uh, over here, uh, let's look at what are some of the main reasons or what are some of the main factors that have been driving uh, port congestion. It, it cannot be attributed to a single one, but in different proportions, these are broadly the things that have led to it, uh, in addition to the what might be a long tail of reasons that has contributed to the same. So the first one, as we all know, is COVID-related factors. Uh, COVID has led to port-specific lockdowns, as we previously just talked about, the lockdowns in Shanghai. Uh, another way in which this has affected, COVID has affected port closures. So if you remember during the, the height of the COVID wave in the US, the number of people taking medical leaves because either they were unwell or uh, let's say somebody in their team was un unwell, was so high that it caused a localized labor shortage in the market, which again led to, led to more stress on the supply chain. What has also happened is that uh, passenger travel has uh, come to a halt uh, during the COVID period. Uh, and because of this, a lot of the cargo that was being transported using passenger airlines actually had to move away from that into uh, into ships and cargo being transported via ships because those flights were not uh, not really flying during that time, uh, which additionally put uh, put more pressure on uh, on port congestion and shipping supply chains in general. The other factor is uh, geopolitical tensions. So as we talked about the Russian invasion of Ukraine, of course it led to port closures in Ukraine, but it also le led to a lot of uh, ships 
rerouting from Russia or ports in Russia because of, uh, of sanctions uh, that were imposed by the global community on Russia after the invasion. So that effect uh, did, did impact the supply chain as a whole in a pretty significant way. Uh, next, there were fluctuations in demand that have been observed in part due to COVID. So the thesis has been that uh, consumers are spending more on goods rather than on services uh, and rather than on entertainment, especially when a, lot, a large part of the world had been undergoing uh, lockdowns, which did uh, lead to certain demand patterns that were different from uh, the ones observed in the past. Not necessarily, not necessarily saying that overall demand increased in such a significant way across the globe, but the patterns did fluctuate and uh, that does put pressure on the supply chains. Lastly, uh, there are the black swan events such as the Swiss Canal blockade. Uh, so the event happened, uh, happened. all of us know that uh, the event led to uh, significant issues with supply chains, but then the event was solved. That said, the effect of the event continues to linger on until quite a significant period of time. So recently I was watching this simulation of uh, how when we are in traffic, it seems like all the cars are moving. There's no accident along the way. There's no car that has broken down, but even then all of the cars are moving slowly. So there's no identifiable bottleneck but the traffic is still there and uh, it's moving slowly and not at a speed that you would expect it to move had everybody been driving in a rational uh, and, and, and at a decent speed. The reason why this happens is that in any such moving system, whenever there is a disturbance, even long after that disturbance is gone, the bottleneck still remains and the bottleneck keeps shifting and uh, it impacts the entire highway. So it's, it's the similar analogy can be applied to ships. So even though the event was solved, uh, the ship moved on, uh, the effects kept uh, being felt long after. Okay, so now that we've briefly talked about uh, what are some of the reasons behind port congestion, let us try and look at what are the different impacts. I, I mean, on an operational level, while we are doing our jobs, yes, the impact is, is there that we observe, but over here we'll try and look at the overall impact for consumers, for different types of businesses and what it means for them. So firstly, for consumers, uh, if my shipments are delayed, uh, it leads to unhappiness. Uh, it's as plain and simple. Uh, if you order food and the food does not arrive on time, you're unhappy. Uh, if you order something on Amazon, it's uh, it's a transcontinental trade. It's uh, coming from somewhere else. It doesn't arrive on time. Uh, you would also be unhappy, maybe not as unhappy as with food, but in general, unhappy about it. Uh, there is uh, the customer unhappiness because of unavailability of goods. So this was observed during the Christmas season. Uh, people were expecting certain toys, uh, certain gifts that, uh, especially in the US, uh, that were supposed to arrive, but uh, the shelves were largely empty for the holiday season. There's also the increased cost of transportation. So the increased amount of congestion has led to quite a few inefficiencies within the supply chain system. And those uh, inefficiencies will cost businesses something, and that cost would eventually be passed on to the consumers. Uh, not saying that the current inflation in the market right now is solely due to supply chain, but supply chain does have a pretty significant impact on uh, the, the, the inflation that is being observed across the globe, be it Singapore, be it US, be it Europe, be it other places. And uh, that obviously is not good for the consumers. We've talked a lot about consumers being unhappy. Uh, that is not a point of discussion from an uh, only from an altruistic sense, but also because unhappy consumers uh, shift. They move from, from the existing, businesses lose consumers if their consumers are unhappy. So due to delay, due to unavailability, the B2C units of the business or the B2C businesses in general have been seeing high customer churn. The customer will go to someone else who's able to provide that in a timely manner, able to provide the goods in a timely manner. And uh, which links to the point I was talking about, about supply chain, being not just a cost, but uh, a competitive driver, uh, a competitive advantage to essentially get more revenue. 
if goods are delayed, uh, in a lot of cases, they are missed sales targets because uh, the goods are maybe not even available and hence not sold. Uh, there's an increased uh, requirement for safety stocks, uh, even at the B2C level. So uh, because if the, B2, if the consumer facing businesses are not sure when the goods will be arriving, but they still want to maintain availability for the users, they will need to stock up. Uh, higher safety stocks means that more money of these businesses is tied up in inventory. Uh, it's locked. There's a cost to holding the inventory, both in terms of capital that could be deployed somewhere else, as well as just the physical cost of, uh, of warehousing and maintaining that inventory. What does it mean for B2B business units? Uh, so as I said, like similar to B2C, there is missed sales promises on delivery. So for example, one of our electric uh, electronics uh, consumer, uh, their, B, their B2B teams were really upset about the fact that uh, they would uh, promise certain dates uh, to their uh, customers and the goods would not arrive by those dates. And uh, because of that, they would need to pay certain penalties, uh, which results in a direct dollar loss. Uh, there is also a big disruption in manufacturing schedule. So as someone who's worked in frontline manufacturing, I, I know that like the planning of a multi-million part, multi-million plant uh, can be totally disrupted and thrown into the air, even if that one small part that was supposed to arrive from somewhere is not there on time. Uh, and hence the need for connected supply chain so that at least even if it's not on time, you know in advance that it is not on time and you can plan for it. But manufacturing disruptions are, uh, are expensive to say the least. Uh, similar to B2C businesses, there is more overhead. So in, for B2B businesses, it might be more overhead in terms of uh, raw materials that need to be stored uh, by these businesses. Of course, while these disruptions are happening, uh, operational staff need to spend more and more of their time in order to manually check for what is going on uh, so that they have answers for their customers. I also looked uh, at uh, what impact this might have. Uh, so they are the typical culprits. There's demerge and detention charges that come up because of a lack of visibility of there being, uh, let's say there being congestion and the trucks don't know when to come. Uh, there is a productivity or like time lost because you keep checking where are things uh, because things are late. Uh, we've talked about manufacturing downstream supply chain planning. You need to have more buffer inventory, more buffer stock, uh, the planning of trucks. Uh, if things are late, you need to expedite those things, which result in a very direct cost. But that said, excuse me, uh, there is the aspect of uh, indirect cost, which is the cost due to customers churning. So a typical container, the value of the goods in that container can go into anywhere between hundreds of thousands of dollars. And that is, I'm talking about more commoditized goods. For specialized goods, it can be even higher. If the customers are unhappy or sales promises are not being met and the customer churns, and let's say hypothetically that the churn is only 1% of the customer switching because there were delays, uh, the end impact is extremely significant. So you can see the assumptions on the right, like let's say there's a 20% profit margin, the lifetime value of uh, the customer is 4x the profit margin and churn increases from 29% to 30%. For every thousand containers you're shipping, uh, your dollar impact overall on the PNL of the company would be around $770,000. So it's not just about the transportation cost of the individual container, but it's also about the cost of the goods that are within the container and what not getting it on time could lead to. All right, now that we've looked at uh, what are the magnitude of congestion, uh, what, what are the factors, what are the impact, I think let's uh, get on to the most uh, interesting part, uh, especially for this audience, which is uh, what exactly can we do about congestion? So the first thing that comes to mind is infrastructure scaling, right? So you can improve the terminal infrastructure. You can improve the port operational equipment so that the ships that are coming in are operated on fast and then they can move on fast and make space for the next ones. Uh, you can deploy creative methods such as pop-up yards, but uh, yeah, so that's one way to go about it. There's alternate route planning. So you go to ports which have less congestion and plan the route accordingly. And then there are efficiency improvements. Let's talk about each of them. So first and foremost, 
uh, with regards to infrastructure improvements, uh, the thing is that one infrastructure improvements take time. They take a lot of capital. But lastly, will they even solve the problem? So yes, demand has fluctuated, but overall demand for the world has not increased in an extremely significant level over the last two years. So infrastructure improvements by themselves will not take care of all the fluctuations that have been taking place. Uh, it is important, it will help, but uh, it is not the only thing. Uh, plus, as I talked about that infrastructure improvement is, it takes time. These are usually multi-year projects and it takes quite a bit of capital. Uh, so you can, I've just taken the example of Singapore. The turnover, the throughput of container on Singapore has not increased in an extremely substantial manner over the last two years. It has definitely gone up. Uh, the other thing about infrastructure improvement is that you solve it at one point, but then the bottleneck shifts. And uh, for all the ports in the world to improve the infrastructure at the same time is an extremely unlikely scenario. The next method is alternate route planning, as we talked about. Uh, the, the ship is taking a certain route. If most of the ports on that route are congested, then uh, the, end can, can, the end user or the POD will feel the heat of the congestion. In order to avoid this or to plan routes better, what is required is visibility into port congestion uh, across all of these ports. And that is what I want to talk next about. So in order to get the visibility into port congestion, you need to know how to measure it. There are two broad ways. One is the median waiting time of the ships at the port. And the other one is uh, the number of ships that are waiting at that port uh, to get a berth. They, it can be measured in different ways. It can be historical, which is what most of the industry is doing in the last three months or last six months. This is what the congestion looked like on this port. It can be live, which takes into consideration all the ships at that port right now, or it can be forward looking, which I'm also going to talk about. So uh, we know it is important to, to have a visibility on congestion, not just for alternate route planning, but for visibility on when your cargo would be arriving. Typically, congestion ETAs are either bases the past or they take into con consideration the congestion at only the next port for the ship. Or uh, they are more reliable, let's say, when, when the vessel is very close to the port of discharge uh, because they're only considering congestion at next port. Uh, but that does not really cut it in terms of helping the users understand when exactly they would be getting their goods. Uh, a better version is something that takes into consideration that tracks all the vessels in the world, where are they right now? It takes into consideration vessels that are, let's say away from the port, uh, but still waiting. So they're not at the anchorage, they do not have an ATA, but they're still waiting, just loitering around. Uh, it takes into consideration the schedules for all these vessels and is able to create an index around what congestion might look like in the future, because the action that you will take will happen in the future. So, that is something that is important that will help mitigate one port congestion, but help companies uh, plan according to the, to the given congestion. So I would like to mention that Portcast has such a con congestion index. We have been using it for a very long time in our ETAs. Uh, now that congestion has become such a dominant topic, we also offer it as a, as a standalone product so that companies can use it to plan better. Uh, this is a rudimentary example of uh, our visualization of our own index. Uh, so you can see that uh, the darker the dot, the more is the congestion over there. Over here, specifically, we are looking at the median vessel delay in ours. Lastly, I would like to talk about efficiency improvements. Uh, efficiency improvements come in multiple ways. They can be training, they can be technology. Uh, one specific thing in which they can be achieved is a better flow of information, uh, information that is also reliable, because as we know, the same piece of information is available from multiple sources. And in our industry, it's very common for it to be contradictory in nature. Uh, to that end, uh, we know that the schedule reliability has not been great in the past, but even so reduced uh, in, in, in the last uh, couple of years, as you can see the drop from 2020 to 2021. Uh, the customers are expecting more and more. So there's the Amazon effect where uh, you can track everything, you know where it is, you know the time where you, you will be reducing it, you will be getting it. Uh, but at the same time, on the contrary, the carrier schedules continue to be unreliable. 
uh, which leads to extra cost per container and uh, essentially leads to all the impacts that we've previously talked about. Uh, the good thing is that the data is available. Uh, it is locked in silos. So some of the data is available with the customers. Some of the data is there in the carrier schedules. There's data from satellites, meteorological data, port schedules, holidays, uh, routes that have been taken in the past, uh, economic indices, which uh, tell us about overall, uh, overall movement of goods across uh, continents in the future. All this data can be taken, modeled, and uh, cleaned up and then shared back with the industry so that they can take certain actionable, uh, so, that, so that they can receive actionable insights, basis which they can act and improve the resilience of the supply chain. Uh, this is at the crux of what podcast is doing right now. Uh, and it is, it is creating a common language of data, getting those conflicting data, cleaning them, uh, going to the most reliable one, processing it through machine learning, and then giving giving the actionable insight that I just talked about. Uh, going a little bit deeper into the same, so there's the carrier data, there's data from ports, specifically the terminals, there's location data from satellite, uh, vessel metadata, marine conditions, all of this cleaned up, feeds into the machine learning algorithm, and you are able to see when exactly would you be getting your shipments? What are the risks? Uh, is there a rollover? Is there a blank sailing? Uh, is your container stuck somewhere? Uh, what are the different type of exceptions that you're observing? And uh, thus plan accordingly. Uh, all this can be abstract at times. Uh, the models might say something that this is going to happen or the ship will go from here to here. It will not take this route. There is a delay of let's say 10 days but it is hard for players in the industry to be trusting that data. Uh, hence, we've taken an active approach in making our AI explainable, uh, which is because uh, it, it leads to more trust in, in, in that data. And uh, we do that through delay incidents that we give. Uh, if a ship is being delayed or we are saying that the ship will be delayed, uh, then we explain uh, wherever possible why that would happen. It could be weather incidents, it could be longer stay at anchorages, it could be port stays, uh, it could be routes that the vessel are following that are not optimal and uh, so on and so forth. A little bit more, just an example of uh, a delay which happened because of a cyclone. We get the data with regards to where is the cyclone originating, where it's expected to move. Typically when something like this happens, uh, how does that change the route of the vessel? What is the alternate route it would take? and uh, what is the delay or what is the impact that it would have on, on specific containers that might be of interest uh, to the shippers or to the freight forwarders for that matter. So yes, I've been rushing a little bit. Uh, I think we are towards the close of the time, but uh, I hope this was uh, helpful. I hope uh, you got to know something, some additional insight from this. Uh, as I said, that we are in the business of providing predictive visibility for all things shipping, be it vessels, be it containers. Uh, and yeah, please, please do reach out uh, in case there are any more questions or in case uh, you are interested uh, to engage with us in any capacity. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much, Shailesh. It, it was a wonderful presentation. Uh, we have a few questions from attendees. One of our unknown attendees asking that, what is the source of your port congestion data and how do you define congestion? Yes, so congestion is determined uh, by two methods, as I mentioned. So one is the number of ships that are waiting outside the port, uh, outside the anchorage. Uh, and two is the number of hours that a ship spends waiting at that port, which also defines the amount of port congestion. Uh, the data uh, essentially comes from multiple sources and then we build the index through processing the data. So the data comes from satellite data on live locations. The data is there from the terminals, uh, not the terminals for specifically the congestion index, but more for the milestones. For congestion, the other data is also the schedules that are published by different carriers, which we then process, find the reliable one, and then see how the congestion would be evolving over time. Okay, fantastic. Uh, one more question from Steve. He's asking that uh, any thoughts on congestion in Africa, similar challenge in the port in Africa? Yes, absolutely. So while I do not have a, a specific comment on Africa uh, on what the numbers are looking like, I do know that it has been impacted by the same problem. I would suggest the same thing. 
uh, infrastructure improvements are out of our control individually, but efficiency improvements, better flow of information is something that we can definitely do and plan better. Great, great to know that. And uh, in your presentation, you mentioned about the connected supply chain. So how and what steps Port Card is, Port Card is taking to make the global supply chain and logistic operation a connected supply chain? Yes, uh, a connected supply chain is a dream. It is my personal dream, uh, having been a supply chain professional. What we do in order to make that happen is get data from a wide variety of sources. Uh, it's from the carriers, it's from the terminals, it's from the satellite, uh, it's from all the different sources possible. We clean that data up, we process it, we build it into a common language that all users can uh, consume and then we share it with, with, with our users. So essentially that is what we do in order to connect the supply chain. We serve as the, as let's say the brain of the data coming from different sources and uh, then tell the players and our customers range from every, every, anyone from freight forwarders to manufacturers to other visibility players to carriers. And, uh, and uh, yeah, essentially that is how we, uh, we connect the supply chain. Yeah, great to know that. And uh, one more question from Bill. Uh... Uh, he's asking that, do you consider Everstream Analytics as a competitive solution? Also, do you currently share your uh, data with third-party TMS solution that can plan and execute multi-leg shipments that include Ocean? Yes, absolutely. So TMSs are one of our customer segments. So they do visibility across road, rail, ocean, air, and uh, they take our data to, to get the visibility for ocean part. For uh, TMS systems that uh, that let's say are much larger, they take certain data points of ours and uh, and enable their clients to get it. So absolutely, we love TMSs. Uh, I wouldn't be able to comment on the specific competitor that you talked about, uh, but I can come back on that. Yeah, great to know that. And uh, before I ask one more question, I would like to you know stop the screen share option and and we can talk ahead. Yeah, so one more question, uh, how, talking about the accuracy of data, how accurate your data are and uh, how do you deal with the complex legacy system? Yeah, uh, with regards to accuracy, we are 20 to 30% more accurate than uh, any other EPAs available in the market at any point of time during the journey. So typically, let's say if it's a 20, 25 day journey at each of the days ahead before the ATA, a 20 to 30% uh, better accuracy uh, can be is what is what we are able to provide and by accuracy I mean uh, anything within plus minus one day of the ATA uh, with regards to legacy systems yes it is a problem so even for us to consume data there are multiple legacy systems there are EDI data there are API data there's uh, even for the output data uh, sometimes we need to do it through the cloud sometimes we need to do it through on-prem systems uh, through large TMSs I think it's just they present a problem, but we are happy to solve that problem. I think there is value in solving that problem and dealing with that uh, uh, with, with the legacy systems as well. Okay, great to know that. Uh, so I think these are the questions that we had for this session. And uh, I would like to thank you so much for sharing the valuable insights and presentation with the audience. It was quite interesting and we really appreciate that. And uh, I would recommend all the attendees to connect with the speaker via one-on-one -on -one meeting option available on the platform. And uh, if anyone, if any attendee that think that the information shared in this session might helpful to him or her in some or other way, please reach out to the presenter via chat option. And all the, present all the presentation will be made available online after the event. So please stay tuned. And Shailesh, thank you so much for your time. We enjoyed it. You thank have you a great so day. Much. Cheers. Thanks everyone for attending. Take care. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye.